recording and zoom live has been started Allah, you are on mute. Ka. You will have to, yeah. As and when you decide to begin. Should we begin or should we wait for uh, another couple of minutes? What are we waiting for, Malaji? No, sir. I we are just waiting for people to join in. Otherwise, we can start. Should we okay. start? I think so. Yeah. Okay.
All right. So, uh, it's my privilege to welcome all of you on behalf of this 100-year-old department, the Mumbai School of Economics and Public Policy. Today happens to be a day with mixed feelings. On the one hand, it's a day when Mumbai witnessed terror attacks and mayhem was unleashed in the city. We pay our respects to the departed souls to start off with. On the other hand, it's also a day when we celebrate our constitution, the Samvidhan Divas, an important day indeed in the history of our nation. It's pure coincidence that we formed up uh, today on having this particular program, but it's indeed befitting to have a discussion on the future of Indian education system on this particular day. Uh, even before I welcome our main speaker for today, Dr. Narendra Jadav, who is our own alumnus, uh, let me start off by welcoming Dr. Minakshi Gopina, who has, is our guest for the first time. Uh, she's one of our two discussants. Thank you very much, ma'am, for agreeing to be as a part of our program. A very warm welcome to you. A hearty welcome to Dr. Narendra Jadav, on who, around whose book we are going to revolve our discussion for today. Professor Pete, the other discussant for today is a part of our own department. And since one doesn't uh, welcome or thank the host, I will refrain from doing both of them. In the audience, let me extend a very warm welcome to our past directors, our alumni, teachers from various colleges across the city of Mumbai, officers from Reserve Bank and other institutions who have joined in. A big welcome to all of you. The way that we have structured today's program is that Dr. Jadav will speak uh, for 20 minutes on his book, and then we will have the two discussants speak for about 15 to 20 minutes each uh, on issues emanating from the book. And uh, time permitting, we'll have some questions uh, which you can put in the chat box. And if they are specifically meant for um, either of the discussions, then you could mention it. Otherwise, it would be for Dr. Jadav. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you can write that out, that would help. I'm going to keep track of the questions and don't, I won't be able to take all, but a couple of them, we will definitely try and uh, do the needful with that. So let me start off by, uh, beginning with an introduction of Professor Jadav. Dr. Narendra Jadav, member of parliament of Rajya Sabha, nominated, he's an economist, education, academic administrator, and author in English, Marathi, Hindi, and wears many hats. Uh, he's a celebrated public figure with 70 national and international awards, four honorary DLIT degrees, uh, in four different states. The Thomas Hart Benton Moral Medallion, that's the President's Medal from Indiana University of USA, and above all, the title of Commander of Order of Academic Farms of the Government of France. As a career economist, Dr. Jadav has worked for over 30 years with the Reserve Bank of India and other central banks. The, he also has worked as an advisor to International Monetary Fund, has been the chief economist of RBI, in 2006, Dr. Jadav was appointed as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pune. With three years, within three years, he transformed the university into a vibrant and dynamic center of excellence, which singularly contributed to making it the most favored destination for foreign students coming to India. The vision of Dr. Jadav had articulated and operationalized for Pune University, led him to the Planning Commission as member in charge of the Education, Labor, Employment, Social Justice, Empowerment, and as a member of the National Advisory Council. As member of Planning Commission, Dr. Jadav has played an important role in formulating the 12th five-year plan, especially in respect of education, skill development. His contribution to formulation of the ambitious scheme titled RUSA, uh, as well as for developing the ecosystem for skill development in India has recognized all over. As member of the National Advisory Council, Dr. Jadav's notable contributions include implementation of the right to education and the empowerment of SCST minorities and DTNTs. He has 41 books in three languages. He has worked as distinguishing professor at the Council for Social Development, a visiting professor 
at Ashoka University and Indian School of Business, Professor Emeritus, MIT School of Government, and a Master in Masters Union Business School. So it's not for nothing that Dr. Meenakshi Gopinath said that we are in awe of uh, Dr. Jadav and uh, have little to add. So Professor Jadav has a perfect blend of experience, been part of the government, he's been at the helm of a university and a teacher. No one better than him to give us insights into the future of Indian education system. Uh, let me also, while I'm doing the introduction, we have a distinguished panel. So let me uh, do the introduction of the two panelists also, and then we will get down to uh, starting off the discussion. So Dr. Minakshi Gopinath is the founder director of Wiscom. That's the convergence of wisdom and compassion. It's been a pioneer, a pioneer in initiating the discourse on women, peace and security in South Asia. She's also the chair of Board of Governors, Center for Policy Research, Principal Emerita of the very well-known Lady Sriram College, and has been associated with it for 26 years. She was the first woman to serve as member of the National Security Advisory Board of India in recognition of her contribution to the field of women's education and empowerment. She has received several awards, including the Padmashri Award. Other awards which have been bestowed upon her include the Indira Priyadarshini Gandhi Award, the Rajiv Gandhi Award for Excellence in Education, the Mahila Shiromani Award, and the Delhi Citizen Forum Award, the Quimpro Platinum Standard Award for Educating uh, Education and Celebrating Womanhood, South Asian Region, Award for Social Harmony and International Lifetime Achievement for outstanding work in the field of justice. She has been awarded the, on, uh, uh, the honorary doctorate degree of letters for significant contribution to the education of women and commitment to fostering global peace through conflict resolution, Latrobe University, Australia. Dr. Gopinath serves on the governing board of several research institutes, NGOs, educational institutions, corporate bodies. She's also a member of the Nonviolent Peace Force International on Council of UN Peace, a UN mandated university. So in Dr. Gopinath, we have a distinguished personality with vast experience again in the field of education. The other accomplished panelist that we have today is Professor Abhay Pete, a teacher in the university for over 30 years, vast experience on several administrative bodies of the university and, and colleges. Professor Pete hardly needs any introduction to this audience as most of us are either his students or his friends. And it's my privilege to fall into both the categories. Currently senior resident fellow at the Mumbai School of Economics and from the point of view of today's discussion, an important designation is that he's on the uh, he's a member of the task force under Dr. Mashilkar looking at the implementation of NEP in Maharashtra. He was director of this autonomous department, the in-charge director of Rajiv Gandhi Center, the chair professor occupying Dr. Vibhuti Shukla chair in urban and regional economics. He's been the dean of the faculty of arts, a member of the management council of the university, of, of university, a member of the governing board and academic council of this. He chairs the economics board at Wellinger Institute of Management and Research currently member of the management board of Gokhale Institute. He's been a consultant to various private sector organizations, governmental international organizations, the RBI, Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, World Bank, UNDP, worked on the steering committee for higher and technical education of planning commission, government of India in the 12th five-year plan, member of the high part committee set up by the government of Maharashtra to get into the re regional imbalance under Dr. Vijay Kelkar. He's also been a member of the high part committee to look at the Nana refinery, senior consultant to UNICEF, the Crystal IDFC Institute. So uh, with our main speaker, as well as both panelists being accomplished teachers, researchers with vast experience at college and university level, today's discussion promises to be a very exciting one. With this, uh, let me welcome uh, Dr. Narendra Jadhav and to request him to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Malaji. Uh, Professor Mala, uh, distinguished panelist, uh, Dr. Minakshi Gopinath, Professor Abhay Pete and friends. At the very outset, uh, 
let me uh, give my best wishes uh, to all of you for some Vidhan day and uh, uh, to all and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great pleasure as well as an honor and uh, to be here on this platform uh, to talk about uh, uh, the future of Indian education system. Uh, this is the book that uh, we are going to talk about. Uh, at least uh, I'm going to start with this book uh, is going to be instrumental in uh, discussing the future of uh, India's education system. And in that context, what is the relevance of the national education policy uh, 2020? Well, friends, uh, after a gap of uh, 34 years, uh, a new national education policy uh, 2020 uh, was announced on uh, July 29th, 2020. Uh, the National Education Policy 2020 is a culmination of uh, a long drawn process uh, and it is primarily built on uh, the Herculean effort uh, uh, in the form of the draft new education policy 2019 or uh, the so called Kasturirangan Committee Report. Uh, the committee report is very big, uh, 446 uh, pages, uh, that two magazine size, whereas the policy proper is only 60 pages. So it is a concise, sharp, and a slick uh, kind of document. Uh, most of the path breaking and transformative reforms uh, in, the in the Indian education system that were proposed in the draft education policy 2019 have seemingly been approved by uh, the new National Education Policy 2020. And that's why uh, I want to start with the Kasturi Rangan report uh, or the draft National Education Policy 2019. My comments, uh, my initial remarks are going to be focused in, on four uh, different aspects. First, I will talk about uh, the Kasturi Rangan report, the positives, the negatives, and so on. The second, aspect is that uh, what are the entirely new proposals in the new education pol in the national education policy 2020 vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Kasturi Rangan committee report. Third aspect that I want to talk about, what important proposals which were there in the Kasturi Rangan committee report which have been either modified or diluted or deleted in the National Education Policy 2020. And finally, uh, I'm going to address the issue, what is still missing in the National Education Policy 2020? So let's start with the Kasturi Rangan uh, Committee Report. Kasturi Rangan Committee Report, uh, it is uh, it's a monumental document. Uh, the sheer enormity of the work and effort that has gone into this report uh, is indeed awe-inspiring. Uh, that's the first positive. Secondly, the Kasturi Rangan report, uh, it aims at evolving an India-centric education system, uh, emphasizing India's rich cultural heritage and values, such as liberty, equality, fraternity, and justice, which are enshrined in the constitution uh, in, in our constitution, which is very apt for the discussion on the constitution day. Uh, the third positive about this report is that the Kasturi Rangan Committee's report uh, attempts to build a framework of, for universal and equitable access to broad-based high-quality education. That's a broad positive uh, comment that I want to make uh, about the Kasturanga report. Let's talk about the negatives now. On the other hand, the first negative, uh, it's not necessarily negative, but the uh, uh, first point that I want to make uh, uh, against the policy, uh, it's not a draft policy at all. Although the title of Kasturanga committee report is the draft new education policy 2019, it is not a draft policy at all. It is simply Kasturi Rangan Committee Report. Second, uh, the Kasturi Rangan Committee Report is based on a very large number of consultations. More than lakhs people 
individuals, institutions, groups uh, were consulted. And this report is coming out of that. However, the report does not have any is there a problem there? Is there some problem there? Okay, I will continue. Yeah. The report does not have the report does not have any structured analytical foundation or statistical basis uh, which can uh, which can support uh, the uh, recommendations which will buttress uh, the recommendations made in the report. While the recommendations are path breaking, there is no sound analytical structure or statistical uh, basis for making those recommendations. That is the second point that I want to make. The third point that I want to make uh, is that a custodian and co committee report sets out several time-bound quantitative targets, such as uh, universal participation in school education by 2030, uh, achieving gross enrollment ratio of 50% in higher education by the year 2035, and so on. However, please note that there are no clear-cut objective roadmaps leading to those achievement of those stated targets. In absence of any concrete course of action or programs of actions to achieve th those laudable, uh, very noble quantitative targets, uh, the draft, the claims made by the uh, Kasturangan committee, uh, they boil down to, uh, boil down to not much more than uh, what can be called lofty intentions. So uh, without providing a proper up-to-date educational status report for people to gauge the economy of the enormity of the changes proposed, this report uh, is uh, seriously lacking there. The fourth one, uh, the, uh, there are a number of uh, things which will come in school education as well as in higher education. I will... Uh, come to that uh, very quickly. Uh, the, uh, it's a very, very good idea that uh, uh, the uh, ECCE, that is Early Child uh, Education uh, and Care, uh, is being integrated as a part of school education. This is a great idea. This, is, uh, this has been a long-standing demand. However, there is no compelling reason uh, to change the pedagogical structure of school education in India. Uh, what they have done is that with the ECCE, with the early education, with the pre-primary education, they have put together uh, standard one and standard two, class one and class two, together with pre-primary. No country in the world, nowhere in the world, such uh, an artificial combination has been made. So it's a good idea to have ECCE as a, as a, as a part of the mainstream of school education. Wonderful. But clubbing it together and separating first and second grade, clubbing it with uh, uh, early education and uh, making that change in the pedagogical structure, uh, I don't think there is any rational basis for that. Uh, then there is a misdiagnosis of learning crisis. Uh, the Surangan report does not recognize the elephant in the room. For example, uh, the real problem about the learning crisis in our country is poor school and teacher accountability. The report, however, makes no mention of teachers' absenteeism, low teacher efforts, and the key problem. And therefore, it is, uh, there is a misdiagnosis, seemingly misdiagnosis of learning crisis. Uh, the next one is that uh, they, there is a provision for census exams at third grade, fifth grade, and eighth grade. Uh, now, this is uh, something which uh, originally when the the Right to Education Act was passed and became effective in 2010, 1st April 2010. At that time, there was no detention policy was envisaged. But later, uh, there was an amendment made to the Right to Education Act, and they brought back the examinations uh, at the level of 5th and 8th grade. And now we are going back again with virtually no exam. Uh, 
So virtually we are going back to, uh, uh, you know, no detention policy. This kind of flip-flop is something which is uh, undesirable to say the least. Uh, there has been a reorganization of the school complexes, uh, great idea, but there would be many practical constraints. In higher education, um, the report is talking about uh, raising the GER, the gross enrollment ratio to 50% by 2035. Uh, this is good, but it is not overly ambitious because it's already way below uh, the global average and um, global average is also going to rise. So it's not overly ambitious. Restructuring the higher educational institution, uh, which is again, uh, very artificial construct, uh, set of institutions, type one, type two, type three, only type one and type two would be doing the research. Type three would be confined only to teaching. The distinction between research and teaching, you know, this is artificial. They go necessarily together. There is no logical reason why type three institutions or colleges uh, be confined to teaching alone and not encouraged to undertake research. Uh, again, uh, all higher educational institutions uh, would be either universities or autonomous colleges. This again is a very good provision but very difficult to implement in the uh, immediate future. So uh, that's the first stage of my comments. Now I come to what is really uh, entirely new proposal. The Surangan report, I have given you positives and negatives. Now let's talk about what are the entirely new proposals that have come up uh, in the National Education Policy 2020 vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Kasurangan Committee report. First, there, entirely new idea, new system, uh, mother tongue as a medium of instruction. Now, this could become very controversial, but basically the point is well made that the medium of instruction, at least until grade five, but preferably till grade eight and beyond, will be home language or mother tongue or local language or regional language. Uh, this is uh, the first completely new uh, change made. The language is slightly confusing. Continuation of three language formula is also welcome. Uh, so th this is a welcome suggestion, but it can be uh, legally, uh, it can create a problem. Uh, the second entirely new thing that has come up is uh, uh, the creation of National Assessment Center. And uh, they have given a wonderful name. They always give very good names to the schemes. Parak, that is the uh, performance. Assess, performance assessment, review and analysis of knowledge for holistic development. Uh, PARAC will act as a standard setting body under MHRD and fulfill the basic objectives of setting norms, standards and guidelines, etc. Now this is uh, a very, very good uh, uh, new idea that has come up in the national education policy, which was not there in the Kasturan Committee report. The third one, and this is a very, very good idea that there would be multidisciplinary higher educational institutions with multiple exit options and academic bank of credit. Now, this is something which was required for a very long time. The artificial distinction between the arts, science and commerce will go once for all. I've been talking about this ad nauseum from 2006 onwards. Students can select the subjects of their choice across the streams and earn credit. And the academic credits that they earn would be digitally stored uh, in academic bank of credit. This would facilitate earning credits from different higher educational institutions, which can be transferred across educational institutions towards a desired degree. This was a reform uh, which was much needed and long awaited multiple exit options is also a very, very good idea. Uh, if a student leaves after one, one year, he or she gets a certificate. One who leaves after two years gets a diploma. One who leaves after completing three or four years, uh, he or she will get uh, a bachelor's degree uh, in all areas, including vocational and professional area. So this is uh, another uh, very, very good addition that has been made by the National Education Policy uh, 2020 to the Kasturangan Committee report. The third set of proposals that I want to talk about, what are the ideas, what are the proposals which were there in the Kasturangan Committee report, but they have been deleted or modified 
by the National Education Policy 2020. First, very important, the RTA Act. The RTA Act came after a long uh, battle and it was passed, uh, it became effective, operational on 1st April 2020. It has still not been the 2010. In the last 10 years, it is still not implemented very uh, clearly and uh, adequately. Uh, it has certainly not been uh, implemented satisfactorily. And the Kasturangan Committee report actually talked about diluting it further. Now, that would have been uh, a disaster. It would have been a major, uh, major counter, socially counterproductive uh, uh, scheme uh, to go back and dilute the right to education act further. Fortunately, the policy 2020, national education policy 2020, doesn't mention that, and I hope that it has been dropped. The second one is National Education Commission. The Kasturangan Committee report talks about establishing a National Education Commission at the central government level, at the central level, and State Education Commission at the state level. Uh, this uh, provision has been changed by uh, the National Education Policy 2020, uh, while there will be a National Education Commission at the central level, at the federal level, there would be no state education commissions. What will there be would be the departments of school education would become the apex body for the school at the state schooling system at the state level. Uh, now, this change is going to be a hard sell with many state governments who will see this as the running contour to the spirit of cooperative and consultative federalism. Uh, this for the state, originally education was the state subject. It was only later that it came into concurrent list. So this is going to be a very sensitive issue. What they have provided for in the national education policy is to, is to uh, uh, strengthen the uh, Central Advisory Board of Education or CABE. Uh, that would be strengthened but how far that would appease the states uh, remains to be seen. Uh, the third change that uh, the National Education Policy 2020 has made uh, with the Vida Kasturangan Committee report is about financing. And this is another, this is a, a completely retrograde step uh, has been taken in the uh, National Education Policy 2020. Uh, you know, uh, it does talk about uh, the ever elusive goal of it talks about uh, the continuously talks about the oh, elusive goal of six percent of GDP <laughs> expenditure on education uh, as a to equivalent to of six percent of GDP. However, uh, it Kasurangan committee had also stated that uh, in addition to that, uh, they had stated that the expenditure on education as the ratio of the total expenditure must be raised from 10% to 20%. This one has been completely deleted or a drop in the National Education Commission, uh, National Education Policy. I think that is a socially counterproductive step. Final point is uh, what is still missing in the new education policy 2020. What stands out there is the out of school children, uh, there are 80 million out of school children in the age group of 6 to 18 and 44 million of those have never been to the school and only 36 million have been in the school but they have been dropped out and there is no the report policy makes only a passing reference that we must give top priority to bringing these children back into the educational fold as early as possible but uh, regrettably, regrettably, uh, there is no concrete action of plan, plan of action or a strategic plan of action to achieve this all important goal. And uh, then there is also missing is a transition to education 4.0 with the industrial revolution 4.0. There is a change, major change needed to education 4.0 that is missing. And the final point that I want to make is the constitution. This is the constitution day. The report talks about the constitutional values, but constitution needs to be brought into the mainstream. And I feel that it should become a compulsory subject at the high school level, constitution and civics together. And that is needed far more than ever before. And that was something that is required 
to uh, create, to generate socially conscientious uh, uh, citizens of this country. Um, and th that is something that is uh, missing. Uh, so in all, I would say that the new education policy 2020, and this is the last point, uh, has a great potential to be a critical turning point and a massive game changer uh, in completely transforming the education ecosystem in India towards the world class and in the process uh, lay the foundation of new India of 21st century, provided that the the, the massive framework presented is fine-tuned further as has been discussed. And secondly, there must be a time, detailed time-bound program of action. And three, there should must be governments, both state as well as central governments, must make concerted efforts to raise the public expenditure on education as a percentage of country GDP to 6% as early as possible. And the fourth one is private sector must respond positively to the so-called light but tight regulation and make honest disclosures, self-disclosures uh, in all aspects of their educational aspirations. And finally, the central government and all states must and should effectively collaborate going beyond the political party lines on the meticulous and effective implementation of the new education, national education policy 2020. And our future depends on it, literally. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Jadha. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Minakshi Gopinath to take over. Dr. Minakshi. Well, it's a great honor to participate in this confluence. Um, as you celebrate your centennial year and, and also be able to share the panel with the iconic Professor Narendra Jadav and the really distinguished Professor Pete. I, I feel extremely sort of almost in, intimidated with the wisdom around the table, but thank you ever so much. And I really want to commend uh, the Mumbai School for actually living out the vision that Profe Professor Jadav has spoken about in terms of what a world-class institution can purport to be. Uh, and not to mention the fact that you're looking at international collaborations, excellence of research, commitment, the values that your students uh, are ex expected to embody. And of course, above all, your very distinguished alumni, including uh, Professor Meghanand Desai, Nitin Desai, Narendra Jadav, Amala Lalwani, and Professor Bhipete, among others. So it's a real honor for me. And I want to thank uh, Professor Jadav in particular for the panoramic vision that he has put out in this amazing book, which is here with me, and for really sifting and, uh, and making the policy or the draft recommendation speak to us in a coherent sort of way, in a way sifting the grain from the shaft, what they call Neerak Shira Vibheda. Uh, had he, and, and also presenting the sensibilities that went into its making. He's already outlined uh, the monumental effort, the wide consultation, and actually bringing on board the consultations and the discussions in the public domain that happened between 86, 92 till the formulation. And it's earlier avatar, the Subramaniam, uh, uh, report on to the draft 2019. But he's made this speak to us in such a succinct and clear way that I would really recommend, I'm not his sales agent, but I would certainly recommend that this book be compulsory reading in, in just about not just universities here, but uh, also uh, the world over. Because it's about how do we make our society, young people, worlds ready and futures ready. Uh, and, and also about how do they see themselves or begin to craft themselves as responsible citizens of the so-called new India while being uh, global citizens. But very politely, Dr. Jada has asked, while he's talking about the fact that it is a, a metamorphic change uh, on the scenario of higher education, he asks this very pertinent question, uh, what is the plan of action to operationalize this laudable action point. I mean, as he mentioned, it is 
It is full of lofty intentions, very honorable intentions. And it's, it, it's important because it was for the first time that the discourse on education has had such a buy-in. You will know, uh, all of you will know that uh, almost two or three among every possible, two out of every three webinars today is on the national education policy. Uh, ever since uh, August, there have been uh, hundreds of them, a lot of them discussing various aspects because it is really a multi-dimensional uh, and almost sort of a mosaic of several trends uh, into a tapestry, which is which is a little difficult to deconstruct. Uh, so I, I do want to say that the no lofty principles are important, uh, that the buy-in, which is astonishing, that it's entered the public discourse, which was initially never even on the manifestos of political parties, suddenly everyone is talking about education. Of course, Professor Yadav, during his tenure in the planning commission, had he seen to it that the plan had become for the first time, at least for higher education, an education plan. And we are all very grateful because the allocation that went for the first time into higher education was truly unprecedented. Uh, the other very important underlying philosophy of this, both the draft as well as, of course, the uh, plan, the uh, accepted policy, is that education is a public good. Uh, so it did make that very important statement, given the fact that today almost 60% of our uh, technical and professional institutions are in the private sector. Uh, it, it could be private investment for the public good, which is something that universities like Harvard and so on do, and his own uh, university at Indiana. Uh, so basically, the fact that education is a public good, and as he rightly iterated, even though uh, RTE is somehow sort of in the shadows, that education is not charity, it is a right. It is a right based on justice. Uh, so personally, I am delighted that the UG space, the undergraduate space, which has been so long invisibilized between discussions on school education and university education, suddenly has received some visibility uh, in both the draft and the do document. Uh, and it because uh, of the 37.4 odd million youngsters in higher education, 80% inhabit this space, the undergrad. This is where the, the, the majority of the so-called demographic dividend resides. It is also the place which is increasingly on account of reservations and other policies of government has become a very heterogeneous space. It is, an, it is a space full of aspiration, but it is also a space that is differentiated heterogeneous. So, the, uh, so both the trials, the tribulations, the challenges, here are young people who are experiencing the joys of autonomy for the first time, the joys, the understanding, civic participation, citizenship, coming to terms with not very easy identities, and for the first time learning the process of, in some senses, attempting to live together at the UNESCO, UNESCO goals had talked about. And this is not, this is not an easy task. Given the fact, as Professor Yadav's book has told you, and even the Asar report tells you that in, in high school, the, the Asar report, the Pratham report of Asar, uh, the annual report on education, tells you that uh, the majority of children in grade, oh, at the age of 14 to uh, 12 to 14, cannot even read. They do not have basic skills. So here comes into the undergraduate space, which is a very fecund space, I'll say, a host of people with millennial aspirations, but very little skills that can enable them to navigate this very complex and variegated uh, universe. Uh, so this is, uh, and, and you will know, uh, all of you know, that today there are around 45 to 50,000 colleges in the country. And in 13 years, uh, that is from 2000 to 2001 uh, to 2014, for example, the number of colleges increased from 12,806 to 39,671. That was the quantum leap in colleges. And you therefore know that in to some extent, some were small, some were uneven, uh, the quality was questionable. In Madhya Pradesh alone, for example, and it has the dubious, I wouldn't say, well, the distinction of opening an average of five colleges 
every week uh, between 2013 and 2014. And Dr. Jadav, I remember somewhere you had written that this was not, this mushrooming was not really helping the image of the undergraduate space. Uh, he's spoken about the three tiers and the I to endorse that, this artificial distinction uh, where only one group can um, aspire to be on Mount Meru. By the way, it's called Meru, the, the, the highest tier of the, uh, and, and why is it? Because higher education is all about technique, but it's also about phronesis and it's also about praxis. And at all levels, both research and teaching, must coalesce to bring out both the, uh, the critical inquiry that is so necessary, as well as to absorb what the discipline is really trying to say. So I, I do, of course, here welcome the possibility that the plan lays out that every college can aspire to be a university. As he has himself said, as when he was vice chancellor at Savitri Bhai Phule, he found that there was excellent research happening at the college level, but that was never recognized because of the polarities of this discourse, talking only either about school or about university. And this very fecund space has been left out. Um, along with, with Meru, I do wanna say there are several outstanding examples of research, but if you look at the various bodies and the acronyms that exist for initiatives in the higher education space, there's somebody who's very inventive in the, uh, there who comes up with these amazing acronyms. For example, there's something called IMPRINT, which is impacting, impacting research, innovation, and technology. There is IMPRESS, there is STAR, there is SPARK, there is GYAN, there is STRIDE, and, and so on and so forth. And it goes, there is CARE. CARE is the Committee for Academic Research and Ethics. So in fact, all this should build an exceptional climate for quality education. And yet, alongside that, we have what is called predator journals. And, and commercially driven PhDs that are on sale. If you go to the Shodh platform, for example, you, they have actually this dis distinction and it's different from the three-tiered hierarchization of higher education, but it's very interesting. I'll just share this with you. For genuine quality, uh, of, uh, uh, where there is only 15% plagiarism, the sale is for 55,000 for every PhD. And for normal, what is called normal quality, it after, a P factor, that is the plagiarism factor is 35%. The sale is for 35,000 per PhD. So we also have this reality when we are talking about uh, sort of a world-class uh, global institutions that is our aspiration. Uh, but there are some excellent, excellent uh, suggestions as Professor Jadav has said. I will speak to just a few of them because there is so much in Professor Jadav's book that every I'd say every five pages is, is a, is a, provides topic for a, for a, for a one hour webinar at least. Uh, now that, there is a lot of talk about Nalanda and Takshila uh, and the essence of which, especially in the Buddhist uh, sort of dialectics, the essence of which was dialogue, dialogue, discussion, debate, uh, you know, vad, vivad and samvad. However, the dialogue was not just between the already converted, it was to present your hypotheses to people from other schools of thought so that you withstood the, the rigor of, of sort of logical reasoning. It was a, it was a whole uh, tradition of public reasoning which had to stand up to that kind of rigorous scrutiny. Now that is something that I think we need to be very mindful of. The other aspect is, and for me, it's been a little disappointing that among the plethora of very, very impressive uh, studies that have been suggested, new courses, very exciting courses, as Professor Jadav said, there is very little that keeps in mind the co contemporary fractured nature of our society. How do we restore the canvas of coexistence that was once in a sense, perhaps not so long ago, a part of the warp and weft of our public understanding of what India is today. So there is nothing on, uh, so for example, conflict resolution or peace building as an area of study, which is burgeoning everywhere else uh, today, especially as the world faces a kind of decline of multilateralism uh, across the world. But I will, I will really come back to just a few issues that I have, uh, I have flagged and Mala, please let me know. I have this tendency not to keep track of time. Just let me know when I'm running out of time. 
Uh, you know, for the transformatory vision of NIP to optimally result in the opening of the Indian mind, I feel we need to, in some senses, de-school, as Ivan Illich said, de-school society, and retrieve the idea of the academy. And when I speak, I speak primarily of the higher education space. So we must provide, the academy must provide for ruminative spaces, it must provide for aspirational spaces, dialogic spaces, inclusive and collaborative spaces. Inclusion is a big theme in Professor Jadav's book. A democratic spaces, I would say as, as, a, as a woman and, and also as someone who's part of this larger community, engendered spaces, and also spaces to envision a borderless world. Now this, the future of in, the Indian education system as a world-class system that can give to the global intellectual commons a uniqueness in the, in the space of ideas lies in its ability to translate these very, very important, uh, shall I say, uh, essential foundational ideas uh, in the, uh, to the academy. But the second thing I do want to talk about is, um, and Professor Jadav has alluded to these in his book, but he has, as I said, uh, been very polite uh, in, the, in his book, very considerate, let me put it, for all the enormous work that's gone into the, uh, the, the policy formulation, there are inherent tensions even within the policy. Uh, and there are dilemmas, or it's possibly that I have read it into them things that they didn't expect to have. However, these did come up for me as I was going through them. Uh, the, the dilemmas are very much related to the kind of practical um, issues that we confront today. The decentralizing impulse and the impulse to standardize. There is that innate tension there. I don't know if Professor Yadav will agree with me. Uh, then there is the, the role of the public and the private sector. He talked about the fact that the finances allocation is very poor. He said that even the computation of the allocations was wrong because actually if you considered all the other departments, it was much more than what was claimed formally. And therefore the 20% of of total expenditure on education that is re requested in the in the draft is too is far short of fulfilling even the basic aspirations of the plan. Then there is the other aspect of diversity and the homogenizing influences in within this document. There is also the tension, if we were, well, not the tension. In a sense, they're two different strands, and how they're going to be brought together will be very interesting because the proof of the pudding will be in its eating. The civilizational identity versus the constitutional priorities and impulses. And the other aspect is the approaches, approaches to inclusion. Uh, the most welcome transformation, as, as uh, Professor Jadiv has said, is that the emphasis on a liberal education, uh, the flexibility, the welcome flexibility for faculty and students to explore different courses, to set curricula, and to actually give free reign to creativity and innovation. Uh, and, and as ha Howard Gardner, you know, the famous uh, educationist from Harvard said, there are the multiple intelligences that are recognized in this document. So there's the verbal linguistic, the logical, mathematical, the visual spatial, the bodily kinesthetic, the musical, the interpersonal, the intrapersonal, the naturalist, the essential. So all of these intelligences can find full play in what is proposed as part of the landscape of education. And of course, criti critical thinking, which provides the conceptual alphabet for democrat democratic praxis and the building of a community of practice. And let's not forget universities as the site of a dissenting tradition, if necessary. You wouldn't have had Galileo, you wouldn't have had Archimedes, you wouldn't have had even Newton if paradigm shifts didn't happen. And they usually happened through dissenting with the formally accepted paradigm uh, of, of. The, other, the other aspect is that the popular notion where the physical sciences were privileged over the, and valorized over the liberal arts and the social sciences ha have, have been reversed in this. And that's a very welcome representation. And, and this is where I, I want to quote my friend Shiv Vishwanathan who says, that the iconography of science needs to be tempered by the iconoclasm of the world of craft, you know, the world of the biogas, the world that touches the lives of people. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, 
uh, Professor Jadav, but I think it was Kancha Alaya who said that when I talked about my parents as illiterate, I didn't mean that they didn't have skills and they didn't have expertise. My mother was an expert threader. She was an expert seedler. Uh, she was an expert farmer. My father was an expert sheep herder. It's just the labors that we put upon them that made there. And this will, I think, ring true, especially for Professor Jadav's great commitment to the, the vocational space, which has been so undermined in, in our public consciousness. Um, I also want to say, therefore, uh, he talked about uh, Education 4.0 and, and the fourth industrial revolution. Absolutely, absolutely correct. Because it's not just uh, you know, the fact that blockchain technologies are going to change things, but also the internet of things uh, and cognitive computing, the whole range of new um, disciplines, which we cannot even envisage right now. How do we create a temperament that allows itself to be open to engaging with those possibilities, things that we cannot even visualize someday? But more important is, let's, not, let's also be aware of epistemic injustice. Uh, for example, when you're looking at the languages, there are no African languages, there's no Arabic there. The histories of marginalized groups, uh, have, there is a slight erasure. For example, history itself by and large or Indian history is seen primarily as through the Shastic texts and so on. The, the icons who are invoked are those who have ha habits, to, uh, whose habitus were the higher echelons of learning. But the histories of, the, of history from below, histories of the people who really made in some senses, uh, what we call the warp and weft of today's Indian consciousness, those have been somewhat, somewhat undervalued. Um, also, there are fields of studies, for example, such as Dalit studies, cultural studies, gender studies, women's studies, that in the last three or four decades have really made enormous, enormous contribution to our knowledge paradigms uh, and in very vibrant ways. Those also, I feel, have been somewhat relegated. Uh, the four-year undergraduate course is a very, very welcome, extremely welcome thing because it gives you multiple exits, as he has said, and I don't wish to labor that further. Um, I, I think I have another, do I have another five minutes or three minutes or how much time do I have? I yes, have. five oh, minutes. Thank you. Uh, the other aspect I think is following from this epistemic injustice idea, how do we understand merit and meritocracy today? By and large, the gatekeepers of higher education systems, the lazy man's handy, a hand, a lazy man, shall I say, a computation is merit equals marks. And we know what that has done to these dizzying cutoffs, unrealistic cutoffs. The other thing is that we don't understand or we don't take into account that merit is a composite of a great many social and economic advantages. So what we really need to look at is rather than use a one size fits all, or a lazy man's guide to merit, we have to see, we have to look at trajectories. We have to look at the way in which we can evaluate how far someone has gone. Uh, how far has someone come? What were the struggles and the travails that they overcame? That is the resilience that we need in the 21st century, as Harari said, because it's a, it's a time of disruptions. It's a time of uncertainty. If there is any one leitmotif of our century, it is disruption and uncertainty. Now, the, the, the struggle of people who travel so far, uh, his own book, uh, The Untouchables, is, is just an amazing uh, uh, you know, reflection of that and the triumph. So uh, the triumph of that whole enterprise is something that we need to. So we need to also retrieve our notion of meritocracy or merit, actually, from be, being caught in the stranglehold of the go growth discourse. Uh, especially since we are talking about the sustainable development goals, I think goal number four is not just talking about a static notion of merit. The other thing is that the monocultural idea that you see here, where you know the state always wants a homogenous domain, but it is education uh, where we want to move out of the sclerosis of standardization. So we need a capacious heterodoxy. We need because learning really involves. And a kind of uh, not a very harmonious reverberation. Learning involves the Marxians having it out with the postmodernists, the Gandhians with the Ambedkarites, uh, you know, the Jungians uh, versus the Freudians. That is the, the rhythm of learning. So to impose a sterile uniformity where a much richer 
heterodoxy exists, I think is something we really need to watch out for. Then equity and inclusion. I think this is such an important issue. Uh, there is a great deal of, uh, shall I say, reference to this in, in, in the policy, and that's very laudable. But underlying, I think the underlying assumption is that all of us in higher education spaces need to decolonize the mind, both in terms of practice and otherwise. No amount of programs and, and projects or, or schemes, whether they are stride or whatever they are, is going to fix this. Because education is not charity. It is a right. And the fact that there are words like upliftment of URGs or the un unreserved groups uh, is, is, is a fairly paternalistic kind of phrase because what people want is dignity. Uh, people want justice. And I think those things we need to. So when you talk about URGs, you're assuming there is an ORG that is well placed and it can be left to its own devices. Now, what about URGs? Are we through these special economic zones, uh, sorry, special education zones? Are we, and, and this is a question, I could be completely wrong. Are we ghettoizing the so-called URGs further? Uh, are, we, are we making sure that they live in their special little enclaves where their interaction with the wider world gets doubly disadvantaged? And I think Professor Jadav's suggestion that they should be located near on the outskirts of metropolises, like for example, Jamshedpur was before the Tatas actually came in, uh, and give them access to a world that they want to explore. Why keep them confined to just a particular community where they have some icons within their community? So further insulating them and, and making it, uh, you know, a kind of uh, what I would call, or what I think a, a scholar has called, the narcissist, narcissism of caste identities. There is a glossing over of the, uh, of the inequalities of caste. A caste is not mentioned. Maybe that is a, a deliberate intention. However, we really need to know that class, caste, gender combine in particularly combustible ways, along with religion, to create oceans of privilege and oceans of disprivilege. We all know what has happened, for example, in the Rohit Vimula case, or even in the uh, Payal Tadvi case, where alienation is double is doubly is is therefore the doubly disadvantaged people much more, and we cannot look at the digital explosion as the panacea for all because there is the digital divide as you recently saw in a tragic death of of, of a young student. Um, multidisciplinarity is often repeated. Uh, the bank of credit is a great idea, but what are these? Um, what is this multidisciplinarity that we are talking about? Is it a perspective? Is it a perspective that sees connections? For example, Daniel Pink has said that the future belongs to a very different kind of mind. Uh, they are meaning makers, they are empathizers, they are pattern recognizers, rather than people who are filled with a particular set of data and so on. Although data analytics is something which has become so important uh, today. I know I'm going on for much longer. There are several other things, affirmative action. We need to get beyond uh, the solipsism of quotas and look at affirmative action really in the broadest possible sense, rather than the number crunching of quota uh, politics. We need to evolve an equilibrium between uh, structure, the disciplines of structure, and democratic space. Internationalization is something that Professor Jadav, in his own, uh, in, as, as vice chancellor of uh, Savitri Pule University, has done so much to support in this country. There is a great deal of misunderstanding about what constitutes internationalism. We need to work at it as investing in India's soft power for the future. Every international arrangement is something that enhances our global footprint in a positive way, not just being what they call a knowledge superpower. That superpower uh, 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 sort of aphorism is not something that sits too well. We, we want to be able to influence international discourse and debate, make friends, why is it that there is so much uh, of a lag between in the student uh, in, who are coming in, even from our neighboring countries? In the 60s, we, we were far ahead of China. Today, Singapore uh, and uh, even Malaysia uh, claims many more international uh, students, not to mention China, of course. So what is it that we have forgotten? The Americans invested in this in a big way as part of their security policy. They won friends through their universities and so on. This inter 
interaction, inter intermingling of ideas is core to opening the universe of the mind. And I really like to thank Professor Jadav. And one particular statistic which must bother us is that about 7.5 lakh Indian students seek universities abroad for their uh, for their education. And they cost the exchequer something between seven to thirteen billion dollars a year. A year. So is there something that we are missing out in this? And do we need to look at it? The other, of course, as, as uh, Dr. Jadav said, there are how will the new regulations pan themselves out? There are so many centralized bodies. And how will the relationship between them be worked out? You know, there'll be usual turf wars, there'll be the usual uh, infrastructure and so on to house so many new people. So there are so many of them. I, for one, haven't been able to figure out, figure my way out of the labyrinth, Professor Jadav. Maybe I need to have a tutorial with you to help me figure them out because there is uh, NTA, there is, uh, as you said, Parak, there is GEC, there is NHERA, there is NRED, NRF, NIA, NAC, uh, and so many other, uh, RISE, the NETF, NCIVE. How will these all work together in a manner that will enable, uh, I, I know I'm running out of time, there's so many other things, but I just want to end on one particular issue that's very important for me. And that is, the, you know, uh, Maya Angelou said once that my, my purpose in life is not just to survive, but to thrive. And I want to do that with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some pride. And I'm therefore coming to this whole business of gender sensitization. There are 16 places where the new policy talks about gender, but it's usually clubbed with women. There are 26 places or two to three pages each where Professor Jadav's book refers to gender in the proper sense of the term as a power equation, as a social construct which involves both men and women. Now in the higher education space, we expe expect progressive ideas on gender justice. And it's not just about the violence of sexual harassment, it is the violence of exclusion uh, because we have today something like 48.6% of the higher education space inhabited by women, 42.4 faculty who are uh, women. However, as you go up the hierarchy, the number dwindles. There is a drop in the female uh, labor force, as you know, many of them coming from graduates who have actually graduated. Uh, we did the Saksham report of which uh, I was a part, showed rampant cultures of silence and impunity and patriarchal norms prevalent in higher education and spaces in India of the kind you will never imagine. We went through the length and breadth of India and we were aghast. And even in the state of Kerala, which has some of the best um, indices, development indices, you would, have been, you would have been horrified to look at the kind of apartheid that existed against women. Uh, so not just women, but men too need to be trained uh, in gender sensitization in colleges and universities. I would recommend, as NAC has recommended, a gender audit. It has asked for gender audit in one place, in a, in a, in a sort of paragraph somewhere towards the end, but it's not really aware of how these audits take place. And we have worked out a kind of formula where you look at organizational structure and culture, you look at curriculum, you look at hiring hiring practices, you look at student services, you look for simple things that who gets to speak at particular conferences, what is the arrangement in which uh, women's research is valued, or uh, I, we are very, I mean, it's wonderful that your school is so gender sensitive and you have a woman as, as head and doing so well, uh, but not many, there are only 15 or 18 universities in, in India that have women vice chancellors. Um, so I, I, I'd stop there, but I do want to say that what Professor Jadav has recommended is that, uh, you know, he, what he has said is that the real voyage of discovery lies not in seeking new landscapes, but having new eyes. And, and he's also flagged, where is the life we've lost in living? Where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge we've lost in information? But we will we will look at the amazing possibilities or the universe of possibilities rather than limits that uh, the, the document affords us. It is, as he said, for us really 
to seize the time and to seize the hour. And there is a whole world to be one. And I would request you all in this context, when we look at inclusivity, we look at merit, uh, we look at autonomy. That's another issue I wanted to speak about, but there's no time. We have to be, we have to be able to take autonomy for ourselves. The battle of freedom is never, uh, never ended uh, and the field is never quiet. So the more we abdicate our ability to engage to larger external bodies, the more we are giving away that thing called autonomy, which is so integral to the land of the mind, to the universe of the mind. Everyone talks about Savidya Yavi Muktai, which is that alone is knowledge, that alone is knowledge which liberates us. But how, how, how much are we willing to be liberated? Do we still live in colonial mindsets or can we break free of them? So these are the questions that I pose before you. And there's so many, so much, so much wealth that Professor Jadav's book has opened up a, a universe really. So Mala, thank you very much. And, and uh, I think we should have several uh, more webinars with other speakers and Professor Jadav so that we can all benefit from the wealth of wisdom that he brings. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's Thank you very much, Dr. Hopin. Uh, may I now request to our Professor Petri to... Yeah. Thank you, Mala. If there are any questions, then please put them in the chat box. I have none so far. I think everyone is mesmerized. So let's... Yes. Uh, you know, thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor to speak on this occasion. Uh, the only problem is I'm feeling like a batsman who has to come after Bradman and Tendulkar and uh, with the ball swinging. So uh, uh, it's going to be a journey from the sublime to the ridiculous now, because I too was mesmerized listening to the earlier speakers, especially Minakshi ji. Uh, I'm always amazed at the energy that uh, Dr. Jadho brings to the table whenever he's involved with anything. And in his multifarious business and uh, other issues, despite all of that, he has been hugely prolific with his written work. This book is a product of his love, a labor of love over an extended period with an appendix that uh, happened because of a disruption, uh, which led to the NEP coming at the right time. And that he was able to provide that uh, very important insightful part of it. Uh, this book of his has data analysis, it's got critical inputs, and it's at once derived from deep conceptual understanding as well as showing his acumen and understanding as a policymaker. And this is no surprise because to some of us uh, who were involved with him and he involved us at the, when he helped the high powered steering committee of the 12th five-year plan as the member in charge, uh, we could already see all that in him uh, firsthand. Uh, although the book discusses all the facets, and today Dr. Jada did mention a little bit about, uh, you know, the early child education, etc. I'm going to focus nearly on what I think I know a little bit about, which is to do with higher education and with the in the context of NEP. Uh, he makes that distinction which he made today between the report and the policy. Clearly. The report was large and then it could have been bigger uh, to accommodate the other things that he mentioned as missing and then policy could have been derived with it. Uh, he has also overviewed and critiqued both the policy and the report in the book and he has suggested a way forward. So the first general point that I want to make is, uh, which is both a description and a critique, that the transformational as the NEP is it presents a laudable comparative static picture, but says very little about the detailed dynamic path in terms of prioritized action plan that will take us from here to there. This is a point that uh, Jadav made, which I want to underline. I don't know whether it's a critique, maybe it was not expected and now it's supposed to be done by others. More importantly, it is rather thin in discussing the very important concern of resources that will be called for and realistic resource envelope that could be made available so that the recommendations are in the realm of what is doable uh, over a period of time. 
Now it's very conveniently talked of 10 year, 15 year horizon, but uh, you know, you have to get to that in a stepwise mode and every year you will have every period of it, you will have to provide for resources in a meaningful manner and take stock. Uh, in any discussion today, we cannot uh, but take the cognizance of COVID-19. And there has been much loss around and uncertain changes in pedagogy and evaluation that has been that have been willingly forced upon us. Uh, even with our capacity limitations, we have tried to cope. By that I mean the teachers and the students and the administrators. Now, rather than thinking about taking the path of reaching the pre-COVID levels and then building up, uh, the question is whether we can leverage this episodic mishap and leapfrog towards uh, something which is in sync with what is expected by the new economic policy, uh, education policy. For example, can we revisit the question of the size of the university? Because on one hand, it's talking about uh, reducing the number of institutions, but having them large. On the other hand, he, it's talking about expansion. Uh, the two will need to be reconciled. To my mind, it is quite possible if we think out of box and have hybrid kind of models and have innovative ideas like vertical universities or virtual universities. Some of them already exist in the world and they are quite brilliant. Uh, liberating us from the land footprint requirements, especially in places like Mumbai and Pune, where land is a very, very uh, costly matter. And to expect people to have now 500 acres that uh, uh, Dr. Jadav could rule over it is very difficult now for uh, going forward. And we simply can't replicate and have more of the same uh, going forward. Now, can we now think therefore of hybrid pedagogies and institutions and organizations that would and focus singularly on the outcomes that are there? Not a very easy thing to do, but that is what is, I think, meant in the, or expected perhaps, maybe I'm over reading it, but that's what is expected in the NEP. It is well emphasized that autonomy, flexibility and quality following the adequacy, equity and efficiency kind of a tri triad is what is going to be the greatest challenge going forward. The problem is even to approach this requires a major mindset uh, change. And I think uh, Minakshi ji mentioned that uh, passing in passing, in a highly bureaucratic and control oriented system, will our readers and authorities learn to let go? For example, we talked of we talk of autonomy, and uh, Minakshi ji made this very important point that we have to take it, and we try to do that. We try to push the envelope. I have found, for example, in my experience, that if you ever go to the authorities and ask, uh, "Can I do it?" They will never say yes, they'll say this rule, that rule. On the other hand, what I call as the Ambani method, which is to do something which we believe is right, and then ask the lawyer department, legal department, or the authorities in our case, to now fit it within the rules, then that works even in the government, at least at the marginal levels. We'll try to have to try to do something like that going forward. Let me also talk about organizational and institutional structure. It's very, very comprehensive. Some of it, uh, the, the two issues are that there is something that we have already, and that is to uh, get the legacy institutions merged seamlessly with the new kind of uh, organizational structure that we will have. Some things like the NAC and the NUPA and the NCRT. On the other hand, there is RSA, MERA, HEGC, NRF, which are all laudable ob objectives. But we need to take a moment and learn something from the earlier experience. Uh, Dr. Narendra Jada will remember that uh, Kapil Sipil uh, tried to do this exact, almost the exact thing uh, with some nine different bills. And I've heard uh, Dr. Jadav talk about those uh, at an ORF function long ago. And, uh, but uh, it, they didn't see the light of the day. Uh, 
uh, we will need to learn something out of that. And uh, just because uh, the current government has a majority, it's not going to work uh, just because of that. It would have to happen through cooperative federalism and the center states and everyone coming together and uh, modifying and compromising a little bit, except for the absolutely uncompromisable principles that we uh, have. Uh, the one thing about RSA that uh, uh, Jadav Sahib talks about uh, uh, as a very good thing, I agree that, uh, you know, having the prime minister at the helm gives it a gravitas. Uh, so does the, uh, you know, the state council for higher education that we already have. Now we call in Maharashtra, we call it Mayer or something like that, uh, which is headed by the CM. You know, it becomes heavy headed. But in my experience, the problem with uh, such heavy committees uh, is that they don't meet because these gentlemen at the top are so busy that unless the prioritization is right, and at the state level especially, unless education and higher education gets the priorities, such committees become dysfunctional precisely because they are headed by, I think, uh, chief ministers and uh, such other people. So that's a point that uh, one needs to consider. Now, we know that any good report must be knowledge-based, empirically evidenced, and participatory. And this one, as Dr. Jadav, and I completely agree with him, uh, is weak except on one count. It has been extremely participatory. But knowledge-based and evidence uh, empirically, no. Because it's not as if we are starting with a clean slate that we are trying to invent the wheel. I mean, we have had right from Kotari Commission, uh, um, you know, Yashpal Committee, Kakor Karmi, Maharashtra, we have had three, and then a fourth one to reconcile the three. So sometimes I think in education, you know, uh, the problem is not epistemic or conceptual. It is to, it's more a problem in the realm of political will and to implement the doable in a realistic fashion. But clearly this is weak as far as uh, the uh, knowledge base is concerned, which has led to what uh, Dr. Jadav talked about, the lack of analytical framework to this particular policy document. Um, in terms of GR, GER again, I think it is uh, absolutely right what Dr. Jadav said and says in his book. You know, getting to 50, come on. I mean, you've, you've got such big people like Kasturi Rangan and a Princeton, young, bright Princeton professor and uh, so many other eminent people in the committee. Are they wasting their time to do something which is going to happen in, with business as usual scenario? If not, then it should have been more ambitious doing that kind of a thing. And uh, with all these people, how did they miss out on, uh, especially the policy, miss out on the education 4.0, which is obvious to all of us, is what is going to go, going to be the main agenda and the main issue going forward. And that is what we will need to equip our students with going forward across disciplines in different ways. But across disciplines, we will need to have education 4.0. And that is something that we will need to go as we chart out the action plan uh, in different states and for the nation also. Um, in a matter of creating world-class uh, HEIs, one lacuna has been rightly pointed out, quality PhDs and teachers. And both uh, Jadav talks about it, the policy talks about it, and so on. But I would think that there is still not a proper understanding of uh, in the policy about what to do about it. Because, uh, you know, this is one of the rare occasions where I might actually be differing a little bit from even uh, the great Narendra Jadav, because he talks uh, in his book about giving monetary incentives and such other stuff, uh, which is important. As an economist, I can't deny. I believe in incentives. They don't need to be always monetary and they need to be right incentives because sometimes minor monetary incentives create perverse uh, actions. And that is what Meenakshi ji was alluding to when she said, you know, you made a make a bad law. You make something like saying that a principal should all have PhDs. I don't understand why. 
they should have understanding of man management and finance and organizational structures but why should a in fact i would bet my last rupee on saying that a person who has a phd in mathematics and a good phd at that would make a horrible principal because he would be so much in his abstract world that he wouldn't make for a good principal who needs to do all kinds of things that are not covered by it. but when you did that see what has happened you had shops now created which will now lead to people all hankering over phd's once you do that people want phd is not for themselves not for knowledge but for becoming principals of a college as a part of their career advancement then that starts happening what uh, madam talked about the 35000 and 55000 rupee shops that get set up and then we have to react to it by having more codification and more codification means more lacuna that would be found out and that's not the way to go you know this is something that needs a greater insight and i would agree with the dr narendra jado that there is a serious misdiagnosis at least as far as the insights provided in the uh, report or the policy are concerned coming to restructuring i completely agree with narendra bajado saab that uh, you know this three way categorization is not meaningful i don't completely agree with him that uh, you know uh, undergrad teachers should be forced to do research uh with the kind of uh, bureaucratic clamping that we have after taking 20 lectures and doing that it might be very difficult to expect them to do research and if you start codifying and having nac come in and give some points to it what starts happening is all kinds of funny seminars where the teachers are forced to read papers which are actually to tell you truthfully not even worth the paper they are written on they are worse than the assignments that we will accept so quality is the casualty here and we need to take care of these kinds of things and then naturally the paid uh, journals and those kinds of things will come up and uh, we need to this but there is a false dichotomy that i will uh, agree to and a better way of looking at it is what we did uh, uh, dr jadav uh, you might have forgotten but uh, since you had made me the convener of the subcommittee under panikar uh, which germinated rusa we had suggested that there should be a tripartite categorization of institutions as well as students and that should be those who are truly excellent let them fly give them complete autonomy those that are average and universal give them funding on the basis of observable indicators and those that are starting off let us start doing hand holding these are three different kinds of inputs as madam said one size doesn't fit all we all know that but we need to have these nuanced policies uh, to be uh, kind of uh, created and uh, Uh, that kind of a thing might be a better way of doing it whether it is to do with public funding and organizational levels as well as at the student level you know in the student level we if we had that uh, we have done something and this is the point about inclusion and i take in all that you say even the technical thing which i must say i uh, kind of skip parts of it because i am very bad at reading through all the acts and for 3.1 section and this and that we should discuss but you know best because you are the person who was involved in doing the rte in that context i'm talking about but we have this habit you know that we start something good and without allowing for teaching trouble and allowing it to take place you know we forgotten kotari commission uh, radha krishna committee where they talked about you know that in education it requires 20 years for any reform to fructify it may not take 20 years in today's day and age but it will still take time but before it that we start throwing it out i think that is a bad thing but coming to what i was talking about and linking at uh, the tripartite thing this business of inclusion uh, and i take in everything that minakshi ji was talking about and she will probably be thinking that i am taking a paternal view here and maybe i am but uh, in a good way i hope uh, but you know when you talk of inclusion uh, at the higher level what are we doing we are creating reservations for students we are uh, saying okay don't pay fees uh, we give them admission and then let them be 
it is very essential that handholding, mentoring, and tutoring, which is a special skill set that our teachers will need to learn for different kind of students, will be absolutely essential. But that will need to be institutionalized and officially recognized. Some good teachers always do this, but they do this beyond the call of their duty. And they don't get recognized when a bureaucrat comes and starts uh, working out the workload and uh, doing the vacancies. And in this context, you know, great universities have a great concept of redundancy. They don't uh, ask you how many lectures you have and divide it by 16 and say, therefore, your university, this department requires only two and a half people. You know, you don't do that. Universities don't get uh, made. Great universities don't happen, uh, as you know well. But that needs to be recognized. I know there is a matter of resources to which I will come to. But uh, the idea of uh, mechanically distributing HEIs across geographies is not something that enamors me. Surely, as an economist, uh, both of us will agree that we have, uh, we have seen the dispersal policy with fiscal incentives fail again and again. Are we not going to learn something from this? Are we not going to get the people to where good places are? Haven't we heard of migration? Haven't we heard of, and without ghettoization, I completely agree with Dr. Minakshi. I don't like this idea of having a separate uh, kind of place where all the so-called URGs are going to live and learn and all that. That is precisely the wrong thing and a backward step. I believe in integration. Uh, as the great Baba Seb did. And, uh, you know, that is where they must be part of the mainstream. They must be given specially skilled teachers who will help them to accelerate, looking at the comparative advantage and the skills they have. And that is the way they must do. Not go about doing the uh, mechanical distribution, every tesil, every block, every this thing. You know, we tried that. Again, we need to learn. We tried setting up central universities. Half the places don't have land. They've taken up some school and have started a uh, university. Main problem is where do the faculty come? Then the only way is to encroach, I mean, uh, kind of uh, take faculty from other places and get them there. There's a limitation. Good faculty is a major problem. They are not going to, you are not going to be able to expand in this particular manner. I don't think that's the right way to go about doing it either. So we need to do this kind of thing. Related to that, again, uh, this whole business of setting up plans, let the state government, I mean, we are talking of autonomy. Central government or the national policy has no business talking about it, how you should go about doing that kind of a thing. Uh, every district, whether it should have an institution or not. Let the states work out a state action plan. Maybe some states will do what they are saying, but give them autonomy. Some may come up with something else, although I'm not very sanguine about it, because if you look at the universities and their perspective plans, I don't think they even, uh, the authorities that be, with some glorious exceptions, don't even understand the meaning of the word perspective. They uh, kind of list certain number of institutions that need to be started in some place because somebody has come and put pressure on them. Uh, sorry to be blunt, but I am being less blunt than what uh, Dr. Jadav is, so uh, always. So, you know, this is what happens in our kind of a situation. And this, despite the fact that there's an absolutely brilliant model document created by Narendra Jadav about how perspective plans should be strategic and minimalistic and all that. Now, some people, what they have done is much worse. They have taken that particular model, stuck them at the cotton paste at the beginning, and their own perspective plan goes exactly later in the second half, where they talk of two pharmaceutical colleges, one year and that. You know, we need to learn about what is the meaning of words. And that's where liberal education will come handy, I think because a lot of our vice chancellors are science people and all these reports, they keep on having categories of patents and stuff like that, that you have to do. And international journals, when our poor lit lit literature people in Marathi and English are writing brilliant critiques and books, but they are not uh, counted, they don't work. You know, general codification, more and more codification, 
is an anathema to good quality. And without good quality, we will not be able to get uh, anywhere. Let me talk. Mala, do I have two more minutes? She is not saying anything, yes, so yes. I take it as yes. yes. Okay. As far as teacher capacity is concerned, I think we already have something called the HRDC. So rather than just talking about the, uh, again, part of something that we suggested in RUSA, you know, had they bothered to look at the RUSA document, they would find that these were ready-made things that are already existing. I'm not saying optimally, but nothing works optimally in the first couple of years. HRDCs have to be strengthened, the human resource development uh, uh, colleges that are set up all over. And not just teacher institutions, because teacher training institutions are meant for junior colleges and schools. Whereas I am able to walk into the class with 55% mark and now maybe with a PhD and I assume I am assumed to have all the skills required to be a good professor or a teacher. Whereas the Montessori teacher requires basic skills. This is a bad thing. And this is where HRDCs will need to be strengthened and the pedagogic innovations that we need to have now will have to be done. Some HRDCs like mine in the university are doing a great job. I think we need to strengthen and build on it. Um, I've talked about the scale, that scale is not to be more for less. We need to think innovatively about scaling up and not do more of the same. Um, but recognize that incentives matter and check the parallel system that is there. You know, sometimes I think we are peculiarly hypocritic in our country. We just don't recognize the elephant in the room that we have. We talk of caste system, we say, okay, unko reservation de do. Then my daughter will go and pay 60,000 rupees in a coaching class and get her uh, admission somewhere. Now, the point that you made is very, very important, but you just spent one uh, sentence on that. The light and tight regulation with transparency. I mean, look at it also from the private sector point of view, please. Don't always paint them as villains because the state is not going to be able to do all that we are expecting from here. But have light and tight regulation. Tell them, okay, you charge this with this caveat so that there is some inclusion there also. And then let them uh, charge the fees. You know, otherwise we end up uh, charging so little for the courses that we are allowed to do in state universities that we are in a permanent uh, financial crisis. So some part of it can be utilized as resource raising measures, which is there in the government resolutions is seen as sinful. I think we need to get away from that mindset. And I'm sure that Dr. Jada would be agreeable to what I'm saying here. Uh, comparative federalism and uh, trust towards private sector, absolutely important. Uh, Well-formulated policy, supervisory checks, accountability, transparency, but from a distance. And that is where, again, Rusa had said that we want an arm's length institutional framework so that the government doesn't interfere every time. Of course, the government has the position there where it says that, listen, we are picking up the pay tab. We are picking up 97% of your charges. And then you tell me I can't say anything, not all. Uh, the ministers always say that to me whenever I have the chance to talk to them. So uh, I think uh, I'm going to stop here. There are some provocative things that you all have said, but I'm uh, we are already running uh, short of time. But um, I think uh, this book is a brilliant beginning, but it's a beginning of a dialogue. I think you have provided a nice book. I can assure, I can tell you something in the meeting the other day in my committee uh, where we have, I mean, I, we had suggested to the government that you should set up a committee which will have, uh, you know, people who will be able to think innovatively and work out an action plan and a resource envelope, which is completely finances relegated from this book. You are talking about, I mean, you have pointed out that it's in the appendix, but really that's not good enough. I mean, just saying 6% business is not good enough. Uh, to the point that Minakshi ji made, 
that you know there it's very little etc uh, there is a further point madam because there isn't enough uh, prioritization of education uh, understood by the governments the absorptive capacity of the governments is very less i remember in one time uh, in our discussions uh, somebody said you know you must have so much of absorption and the secretary of government of india pointed out listen you are talking of hundred fold increase i don't mind putting it but you know whatever has been granted you are able to absorb only 40% of it and my state maharashtra unfortunately in some study i had done is laggard it's one of the 14th or 15th in the major states in when it comes to absorbing funds from the state government so you don't have funds but you don't even have yeah in marathi we say dubli maji zoli that kind of a thing you know we are not even able to absorb the funds that are available but we need to uh, do something more and get the private sector in and think of other innovative ways of resource raising because not by government alone so to end uh, it has been a pleasure labor of love for you to write a labor of love for me to read through to as i said i must admit some parts i skipped through uh, but uh, this is a beginning of the dialogue in our committee uh, our chairman uh, dr mashelkar in fact pointed out that this book of yours had reached him and that probably will be a compulsory reading as a member i will be able to say that i have read that book already so this will be an important statistical base that we will begin with and hopefully we'll keep on referring to you again and again when we start uh, our deliberations and get to the business end. thank you very much thank you thank you professor petit uh, there are five or six questions all directed to dr jadhav so uh, maybe i can just run through some of them and uh, if you can respond we can take the for 10 minutes we could do that so the first one is how to ensure teacher accountability or uh, so this is a student who is affiliated to savitri bai phule university he has requested that his chat questions in the chat which are long and detailed be sent to you which i will do but uh, this is one question from him and he says he would rather prefer to learn from swayam portal and things like that so he is a bit uh, disillusioned with uh, the teachers which are there the second question is won't exit policy at graduation dilute the quality the third question is that is there any sop for stopping dropouts the fourth question is will the private sector do voluntary disclosures the fifth question is education for uh, or the 4.0 is a part of implementation so to be fair to the policy we could uh, it is not to be expected to be in the policy document as such uh, the sixth question is that will encouraging both teachers and students to come up with innovative methods of dissemination of knowledge actually enhance the quality of our education i think we'll take these six questions and uh, one more which has come in will nep 2020 be mandatory for all schools including cbse icsc ib schools and universities including deemed universities who have tied up to foreign universities so these are the seven questions to jadhav okay all right uh, well i have, we are already we are way behind schedule and in about 15 minutes actually i am going to start another uh, webinar okay. where i am going to talk about the constitution uh, constitution uh, since this is the constitution day uh, uh, first of all uh, let me uh, thank both panelists for their wonderful uh, presentations mesmerizing indeed that was the word used and uh, i have uh, rarely if ever seen a, uh, a discussion in webinar being so productive and uh, so useful and uh, i i i think uh, Uh, it it was a uh, mesmerizing experience for all of us including myself uh, uh both panelists spoke extremely well and uh, 
Uh, the light to heat ratio was very high. I am uh, thankful to both of them, uh, uh, and I entirely agree with uh, with them uh, in their uh, detailed comments. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, their comments are so important that uh, we really need one hour discussion each on their presentations and uh, the ideas that were thrown up in their presentations. Uh, and uh, Professor Pete is absolutely right in saying that what this book has done is to begin a dialogue. This is the beginning, not the end. And I hopefully this is a good beginning. And uh, yes. both of my <laughs> list have, uh, have said that. Um, uh, but we need to take this process further. And therefore, there is a need for uh, this dialogue to continue, and uh, 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 I could take uh, these questions, but uh, it will take uh, a lot of time to do okay. justice to uh, these questions. What I would urge you uh, is that my email ID uh, uh, to, uh, uh, is that you can share my email ID with them, or I can uh, say that here, drnarendra, uh, dot zadha, uh, at gmail dot com. drnarendra, one word, dot zadhav at gmail.com please send your questions uh, on, on, on the email and uh, I will do my very best to do justice uh, to the questions and I will try to answer uh, in a webinar like this one does not expect all the questions to be answered the very fact that many questions have been raised in your mind uh, is actually making a beginning of addressing them. You know, without the webinar, probably those questions would not have cropped up in your mind. So this is a very, very good beginning uh, of a dialogue. And uh, I'm grateful to Professor Mala and her colleagues for having organized uh, this uh, uh, discussion and organized it so well. And I, I want to thank uh, all the participants who have raised questions. N Narendra ji, if you don't mind, uh, just to say hello to Mr. Rohan, who is a student who asked you, and all others are quite uh, experienced professors and all that. If you feel like, just spend about half a minute. Uh, on uh, the first question about the teacher accountability? Yes, that's the question by a student. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, as a, as a vice chancellor, uh, we had different ways of uh, achieving teachers' accountability. I do not uh, want to go through the details, but what is important is that I have pointed out in the book that there is a kind of misdiagnosis of uh, the crisis in the field of education that we have. Uh, I can tell you the... Uh, you know, I, I can fully understand that this student is demoralized with teachers and he, he or she thinks that SWAM would be uh, a better platform to learn rather than teachers. Because, you know, what has happened is that over a period of time, two things have happened. One is that curricula have not been revised for a very long time. You know, uh, I know many teachers, many professors who come to class using the notes that they had taken when they were doing their master's degree and uh, start writing on the board without talking about it, without discussing and without getting everybody involved. Now, this is bound to demoralize the students and that is, that is what has happened. So one of the very interesting things that I did as a vice chancellor of Sanitary by Fuller University was to revise entirely the curricula of 484 courses. And that was done uh, with the help of the relevant industry experts outside the university. Because there is a kind of chasm between university and society. You know, uh, our founding fathers had thought that the university and the society would grow in tandem. They would develop in tandem. They will be acting in a mutually reinforcing manner. That has stopped happening a long time back. And there is a disconnect between what is happening in the field of education and what the, the realities are or what is happening in the society. And therefore, you know, uh, teachers' absenteeism or accountability is only a reflection of uh, uh, lack of accountability. It's only a reflection of the disconnect between the education and the society. And we need to work at it. And there are strategies that can be devised. 
what I complained was that in the 447 magazine size book, the Kasturi Rangan report, which forms the basis of national education policy, does not refer to teacher accountability at all, does not talk about teachers' absenteeism and the issues like that. And that was much needed. And I would uh, like to address that question. Uh, in the Malaji, I want to thank you for uh, providing this platform and conducting this discussion. Uh, and such a wonderful discussion, uh, discussion to be remembered by all. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So as we come to the end of the program, my pleasant duty to propose a formal vote of thanks. So the NEP per se may have limitations as we have spoken about, but the fact that it has set into motion discussions such as this makes us very optimistic sir, about the future of Indian education and the fact that it is in safe hands. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jadav, for having given us this opportunity to host the program. Thank you very much to Dr. Meenakshi Gopina for the insights that you brought into the discussion. I'm hopeful that this first experience of yours with us is the beginning of many more interactions which we will have with you. I started off by saying that Professor Pete is our own and hence uh, welcome and thank yous are not going to be uh, don't, they're, uh, they're out for him. However, I would like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to him for not just agreeing to be a discussant today, but uh, for having been a mentor to me ever since I joined this department. And especially over the last three years that I have held the post of the director. Uh, in fact, I can't thank you enough, sir, for the angelic patience that you have shown with me, a quality of yours, which I'm sure that uh, is a revelation to you yourself. <laughs> As I demit the office of director of this department in a few days from now, uh, I think there could not have been a better way for me than to host this discussion on the future of Indian education. A big thank you to the audience who have enthusiastically joined in today, as well as for the many programs that I have been organizing. Uh, I may not come before you as director of the department, but that hardly matters because the affection and the support which I have received are my own, and I'm sure that they will there be there with me always. So thank you very much once again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Narendra ji, we will need to talk afterwards. Sometime, now I have been inducted into this and we very much have the 4.0 education as a part of the subgroups that we have set up. We are doing it quite systematically. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that there will be enough people with out-of-box thinking. But okay. uh, let's see how it goes. I'll keep you informed and I'll keep referring to you. Wonderful, wonderful. In the next couple of days, I'll give you a call and let's have a chat. Yeah, we will talk. Yeah. Okay. All right. Vinakshi, right. this is the first time I'm seeing you, but uh, the way you were speaking was actually captivating. I mean, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And a lot to learn about and so on. So uh, as Mala said, I hope uh, we will get an opportunity to listen to you. Because yeah. the, apart from the gender, the, the other thing that is missing here, which is not emphasized much, is the minorities that need a greater, and minority women especially, we need to do something special about also. But there is so much that we can talk. But uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Narendra ji, best of luck for the next program you have. Yeah. And you better have something hot next to you. <laughs> So that <laughs> your throat is okay. Right, 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 right. Bye, bye. All bye, the bye. best. All the best. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Should I end the meeting? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.